The crimson mushroom cloud engulfed Beirut. A blushing bride blown off her feet. And a mother in labor brought new life into a world turned upside down. This hellscape is the aftermath of the massive explosion believed to have been caused by over 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate, carelessly stored for over six years at the city's downtown port. Seema Jelani moved to Beirut from Texas, is seen here in the back of an ambulance, soothing her injured daughter. I have a gentleman next to me who's holding his head. His head is he's bleeding onto me. Um, and I'm singing, you know, I've got peace like a river, and it makes no sense whatsoever. Jelani is no stranger to conflict zones, having worked as a humanitarian aid doctor for years, but never had she seen anything like this. I have worked in Afghanistan, Gaza, post-conflict Bosnia, Iraq, Pakistan, um, even Lebanon and Egypt. And this was, even as it was happening, I was thinking this is either something bigger than war. It's not a car bomb, it's not um, gunfire, it's not accidental, something is happening. Several of the city's hospitals were destroyed. More than 160 people killed, 6,000 injured, and at least a quarter million were left homeless in an instant. Lebanon was a nation already on its knees. Its economy collapsed months ago, the coronavirus was surging, and then the unfathomable. This was the beating heart of Beirut's legendary late night district. And in just a few seconds, devastation. Residents say they only have each other for support. Armies of young volunteers with brooms, brushes, and dustpans have been sweeping away the glass and debris so people can return to their homes. The government, nowhere to be seen. Rescue crews from around the world have traveled to what's being called Lebanon's Ground Zero, securing the site and searching for survivors, a task which soon became a recovery effort for remains. The epicenter of the blast has also become something of a tragic meeting point for those looking for loved ones, including for Tatiana Hasruti, whose father worked at the port. He and many others are still missing since the explosion. She's hopeful he's still alive. What would you say to him if he could hear you? That I love him. We are all waiting for him. Everybody's searching for him. Hasruti says she's furious Lebanon's leaders have failed her and her father. I think Lebanon deserves more than this, better than this, and we deserve better too. Still, there have been extraordinary moments of hope, like when this woman was pulled from the rubble three days after the blast. But mostly, there's despair and growing rage. For days, the shell-shocked residents of this shattered city have flooded the streets, demanding change. Amid the plumes of tear gas fired at them by Lebanese security forces, protesters chanted revolution and blamed this perfect storm of misery squarely on the nation's cruelly corrupt and deeply inept leaders, many who have been in power for decades. You're calling for a revolution. We already have one. I mean, we're calling for change. And as long as there's no change, there's going to be a revolution. But how to revolutionize a corruption-riddled government born three decades ago from the ashes of a brutal 15-year sectarian civil war? Few here have answers but some are calling for blood. Although the prime minister and other government officials have resigned since much of the city was laid to waste, Lebanon's most senior leaders are digging in. President Michel Aoun is refusing to allow an independent international investigation into what caused the explosion, calling it a waste of time. And so the protests continue and the anger only grows. Lebanese security forces have just been tear gassing Everybody that they can, they cleared up this area. The protesters, protesters are calling for the system to fall. How this city will rebuild after one of the largest non-nuclear explosions the world has ever seen is still unknown. World powers, including the U.S., have pledged nearly $300 million in aid, conditional to political and economic reforms. But Lebanon's ruling class has survived major conflicts and crises before, and they may just survive this one too. 78-year-old May Maliki has seen a lot in her life. She survived the brutal civil war that raged in the 70s and 80s and later conflicts with Israel. But like her piano skills, her resolve is as strong as ever.
everybody says there is no hope. But I cannot, I don't want to believe it. I want to uh, keep hoping that each time these catastrophes happen, we stand up and start again. MTS Time, CBS News, Beirut.